This is a major, major part of uh, Jewish life. It's a, it's a big deal. Um, and uh, that will sort of we'll, we'll jump right in. I, I guess just maybe just take a step back. Uh, what keeping kosher is about? Why? Uh, Torah doesn't really tell us explicitly why, but it seems to be uh, connected in the Torah to being distinct, to being holy. Um, one compelling explanation to me: uh, some species of animals are kosher, some are not. It's almost arbitrary, but like that's a distinction that God made. Some things we eat, some things we don't, and so too the distinct distinctiveness of the Jewish people is also arbitrary. But we do have. We believe a mission. We, we do have a purpose that we're supposed to accomplish as Jews in the world, and so that matters, right? And so to the things we eat, right? In other words, it's like it's like a um, it's like a um, what do you call it? Like a, like an echo or like a fractal, you know, the same shape but kind of in a larger scale. So we have these. We're confronted with these arbitrary distinctions between animals. They're all created by God. They're all kind of the same, but we treat some differently. And so, also as a nation, we're all people. We're all human beings, but we try to make, we maintain our distinctiveness because we have a distinctive mission, something to accomplish in the world, and so uh, that's sort of, that's an echo, it's an echo, or that's a, a, of the kosher rules. Uh, and this was recognized by um, the early Christians when in the book of Acts, where it describes uh, the abrogation of the laws of kosher, it comes in the context of, uh, kind of, of erasing the distinction between Jew and non-Jew, which is like a major um, move that the early church makes that these, that this divide between Jew and Gentile is abrogated in the new religion. And so we believe that the distinction between Jew and non-Jew is still important, that we still believe that we have a unique mission, a covenant with God that endures. Um, and so we therefore also, we believe all the rules, all the mitzvot of the Torah endure, and these distinctions, some are, some are arbitrary, but they're there in the Torah, we maintain them. So kosher species, what are the kosher species? Um, the Torah lists kosher animals. The Torah divides animals or, or things that we eat into three categories, land animals, uh, sea animals, and things that fly. Things that walk, things that swim, things that fly. That's, that's the Torah's taxonomy. Things that walk uh, are kosher if they have two characteristics. They have to have a split hoof and they have to chew their cud. They have to have both of those characteristics. So what are some examples of kosher species of animal? Cow. Cow, good. What else? Chicken. Chicken. Deer. Uh, that's not the chicken. We're going to bracket for a second because we're going to do the birds later, okay? Chickens can fly. Uh, deer, good. What else? Goat. Goat, good. Sheep. Sheep, good. Is uh, buffalo kosher? Yeah, bison are kosher, absolutely. <laughs> Giraffe. <laughs> Giraffe <laughs> is kosher. Ox. It's it's very hard to um, to, to literally slaughter a giraffe. It's, a, yeah, it's, a, it's sort of a, presents a challenging uh, kind of but uh, giraffes do a split hoofs and they do chew their cut. Uh, what else? Anything else? Ox, moose. Ox, moose, good. Uh, very good. What's not? Okay, what's the animal that chews its cud but doesn't have a split hoof, a fully split hoof? Camel. Camel, good. What else? Pig. No. No. Horse. Horses also. Horses chew their cud. I mean, they eat grass, they chew their cud, but they don't have split hoofs. What? Is there any animal that has a split hoof but doesn't chew its cud? Pig. Okay, very good. Okay, great. Okay, so there you go. So it has to have both of those simanim, both of those signs to be a kosher animal. Uh, what about okay, things that uh, swim have to have two characteristics. What are they? They have to have um, scales. Scales and, and fins. Good. So what has fins but no scales? What has fins? Shark. Shark. Shark has fins but no scales because they have sharks don't have, have scales. They have like a kind of rough skin. Uh, what else? What else has fins but no scales? Catfish. Catfish. Catfish have like skin but not scales. What else? Dolphin. Dolphins. Good. Fins but no scales. What else? Stingrays. Good. Rays, exactly, which are sort of related to stretch. What else? Fins but no scales. Anything else? Uh, what about uh, neither fins nor scales that lives in the ocean? That would be dolphins, dolphins. octopus. Um, dolphins have fins, but um, but uh, mollusks don't. Um, like uh, mussels, clams, lobsters have neither fins nor scales. Um, what has scales but no fins? That does not exist. Does not exist, very good. But the Torah still mentions both the sea money, so it's sort of a curious question why. Okay, fins and scales, those are those. So what does, what is kosher? Kosher fish would be? Salmon. Salmon and tuna. tilapia, tuna, good. What else? Whitefish. Cod. Uh, yeah. Codfish, good. Rainbow trout, okay, lots of many, many. Uh, sardines, okay. Herring, many, many fish. What about, um, what about sturgeon? Sturgeon kosher? Yeah. I don't think they are. I think sturgeon, I believe sturgeon have 
scale. I think they have like a scale, they're sort of like catfish. What about yes? Isn't there a debate about swordfish? There's a debate about swordfish because swordfish have scales when they're young and they lose their scales if they get older, so it's a debate. Okay. So is the, the like, definitive answer pretty much don't eat it? Um, I think the more common answer is not to eat it, but there are some very influential uh, scholars who say that it's kosher and uh, so. Kosher only when it's a baby? No, 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 just no, no, even when it's adult, yeah. But you shouldn't, you know, swordfish are actually, they're, they're um, I think they're kind of in danger from overfishing, so it's probably best to oh. just lay off the swordfish anyway. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not like I regularly yeah. eat it, I just... Yeah, yeah. I so, and then, so it's, um, yeah. I'm not saying the issue in great depth, I just knew, I know that there's some, there's some impressive, um, uh, influential names on both sides of that debate. Okay, that's, that's the swimming things. What about things that fly? Birds. So birds, the turret doesn't give semen, it doesn't give characteristics. The Torah just lists species of kosher and non-kosher birds, and it's left to the Talmud to derive the characteristics. So the lists of birds that are kosher, the birds that are not kosher. Basically, the birds that are not kosher are birds of prey. So uh, eagles. Eagles, owls, vultures, falcons, uh, right? And the non-birds of prey are kosher, okay? But the, the Talmud then kind of, because it's not always so clear what's a bird of prey and what's not, what's an aggressive bird, what's not, so the Talmud talks about birds that kind of use their, their talons to grasp. And, and talons, you know, they have, birds with talons have two toes in front and two in back for the grasping things with their um, talons and using them to help eat and, and catch prey. Um, parrots have two in front and two, a parrot perched on a, have two, two toes in front and two in back. Uh, in contrast to kosher birds, even when perched on a branch, will have two in front and one in back. So a dove versus a parrot perched on a branch, you can see how their toes uh, are, um, are, are raid. Okay, so kosher birds have uh, three, two or three, three, uh, three in front and one in back. Non kosher birds have two in front and two in back uh, when they approach. Um, the other, you know, uh, kosher birds have a crook of them, they have a, um, a gizzard that if you split, you can peel with your hand. Um, that indicates its diet. Okay, it's a vegetable. It's, it's a vegetable diet, so it has a gizzard to help digest. You know, birds don't have teeth, so they have a gizzard which sort of like grinds up food that they eat after it's um, swallowed. Um, and the gizzard of a kosher bird, if you were to cut it open, you could peel the inner lining with your hand. Okay, it's a little bit strange. Uh, I've seen it done; it's a little gross, but that, that that it indicates it's a way to indicate the diet, and that that's a way you can sort of identify the species. Um, uh, there's some other um, kind of has a digestive system, internal anatomy of a kosher bird. Uh, but it's basically, it's about the bird being a, you know, has a vegetarian diet, not being a bird of prey. Or not a vegetarian diet, but not being a bird of prey. Um, so what are some kosher birds? Well, chicken. Chicken. Um, turkey. Turkey. What else? Duck. Duck, good. What else? Okay, partridge, quail. Goose. Goose, good. Um, okay, maybe some, um, maybe some others. Uh, Several hundred years ago, the kind of pendulum switched away from relying on these simanim, these signs, these anatomical signs of kosher bird, towards uh, also wanting to verify that a Jewish community actually ate this bird and has a tradition of eating this bird. And so now we really want to, it has to like have all the characteristics of kosher bird, but also um, it has to, um, like a Jewish community has to like have eaten this bird. So we have like um, medieval, um, wood carvings of like, from like Italy in the um, late Italy, the 1600s of like, these are drawings of all the kosher birds. It's clear that they used to eat fe um, pheasants and peacocks and a whole bunch of other birds. You can just tell by the drawings, but there in fact is no Jewish community that has maintained an active tradition of eating peacocks or eating pheasants, so they're really not considered a kosher anymore. But the ones that we still eat, we continue to eat. There are some questionable cases, like the Muscovy duck is a kind of buck duck that's native to the Americas. When the first religious Jews came, you know, captured it in the early 19th century, they um, didn't know, is this like a duck that like, we ate in Europe? Is this a new type of bird? They sent samples back across the ocean for adjudication and subject to halakhic kind of. The earliest halakhic literature, Jewish legal writings from America, concern the Muscovy duck. If you go down south, you can see that it has very large, weird looking ducks. Um, same thing with even chickens, like chickens that, you know, there are all sorts of breeds of chicken that get spread and introduced, and there were chickens that were brought to Europe in the also in the you know, 19th century um, from the East. Uh, Queen Victoria had some in her 
garden. And also, like books were published, you know, debating is this type of chicken kosher or not? Is this similar to the chickens that we've been eating for centuries, or is this like something different and maybe more aggressive and should not be considered a kosher chicken? Uh, most types of chickens, almost all types of chickens, are considered kosher. Um, but uh, it's you know, each type has to be checked. The, the way you know, there's a um, there's a fellow who is in charge of birds at the OU in their kosher division. What he will often do with a partridge or a chicken hill hill that I haven't seen before, he will raise several generations of the birds in captivity and see if their life cycle is really, really similar to other chickens, um, such that it's just a chicken with like different kinds of type of plumage versus a really a different species. They'll introduce it into an aviary and see if it hangs out with the other chickens or, or keeps apart. And, and, uh, and that's a way that a certain like st a strain of chicken or partridge or quail could be identified as a kosher species. Um, but not always. There's a type of chicken he told us about called a silky. I don't know if you raise chickens or not. They, they look like them. They have kind of long, um, they have black skin and very long, uh, kind of fluffy white feathers. Um, so uh, they look not, they don't really look like chickens. Um, he uh, brought one to uh, a panel of distinguished rabbis who and he put it on the desk. And they're like, this is not a chicken. If it is a chicken, I've, <laughs> I've studied this bird. I know it's definitely a chicken. And they, uh, the, the, the there was like a high school that met on that location, so they like opened the door to the office and they found a high school kid who was like cutting class and they drag him, him into the office and they shows the door and they say, What's that? And he looked at me and said, It's it's a rabbit, I think. And they said, Get out of here. And so they said, Not kosher. And he looks like doesn't look like a doesn't look enough like a chicken. So you can see pictures that you can look up the uh, silky chickens and let's see what you think. Um, yeah. Is there any work being done on sort of like lab created meats and things like, like yes. stem cell meats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's, there is, there, there's stuff being written about. Like, uh, yes, yes. Is there like, there's no short answer on that. No. Okay. But I'm then happy to refer you to uh, articles like stuff is being written about uh, like cultured meat. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a, uh, it's an exciting frontier of Jewish life. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, it could solve a lot of problems, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So that's kosher, kosher species. Um, so, where are we next? Okay, B. Oh, another important thing now. Um, kosher, all these kosher species of, of animals and birds have to be slaughtered in a kosher method. You know, in the Torah, the only way to eat meat is to bring a sacrifice in the temple, and parts of the sacrifice are burnt on the altar, and parts of the sacrifice are given to the priest in the temple, and parts of the sacrifice are eaten by the person who brings the sacrifice. And depending on the type of sacrifice, Either you get most of it, or all of it gets burnt, or the Kohen gets most of it. Different types of sacrifices, different rules, and if you read the first chapters of Leviticus, they're all right there, black and white. Um, in Deuteronomy, the Torah says, well, actually, you know, once you go to the land of Israel, you're going to be spread out over a whole you know, territory. It's going to be very inconvenient to every time you want to eat meat to come to the temple and bring your sacrifice. So if you want to eat meat, you can eat meat wherever you are. It won't be sacred, it won't, be, it won't have all the rules of a sacrificial meal. Um, but you still have to sacrifice and do this, the shechting, the, the slaughtering, in the manner that a sacrifice would be slaughtered in the temple. And so, all the, so that's why even these kosher species have to be slaughtered uh, by a shochet, by a kosher slaughterer, um, which is a uh, task that is, um, it requires a lot, a lot of study. It's, um, kosher slaughter has, um, the knife is very, very sharp, and uh, you know, sharpened on a stone to a meticulous degree of sharpness, you should be able to run the blade over your thumb or even over your tongue. That's how sharp it is, like without any, um, without any nicks or, or, you know, or any um, adhesions or any imperfections. I've seen, I've done this, I've, 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 I've rubbed a kosher knife over my thumb and it's, it's incredible. It's like, it's like, um, like the sharpest thing I've ever imagined. Like you can't, it's sharper than anything, the sharpest thing you could, you could possibly imagine. Uh, it feels it's like, like butter. It's like so smooth, so, so smooth, so well polished and sharpened. Um, you know, they get these special um, sharpening stones from uh, Japanese, uh, uh, like Japanese knife, like catalog. You know, which I you know, like. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool. Um, the shkita, the shek, is done in one motion without any pushing, without um, uh, you know, it's, without any pressure applied. It's just a back and forth uh, motion with no 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 no, uh, no pressure applied, and the shkita has to sever. The trachea and the esophagus, um, sort of in that in that cut. In so doing, the uh, aorta and the jugular vein are also severed, and so that that's sort of probably what that's what kills the animal uh, very very quickly. It's uh, 
supposed to be a, a painless death for the animal and a respectful uh, death for the animal. Uh, a great deal of care, you know, when, when this is done properly, is devoted to making sure the animal isn't, um, you know, isn't put to any unnecessary pain in the slaughtering process. Um, what if they don't do it all in one? I believe they, they, can, they can go back and forth. They just can't, uh, I believe, as long as there's no delay between, they can't like pause in the middle, and uh, they can't uh, like, apply pressure. Right? If if, um, if you have a paper cut, right, it's not the cut that is painful. It's the like when the pieces of cut skin like touch each other again. That's the pain part. So that's sort of I think the thing to mix. Not that the cut itself should be should not be it's so sharp, and there's nothing that 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 nicks on. There's nothing to catch. On the fact because the knife is so smooth. Yes. And what's the underlying philosophy? I mean, it seems pretty obvious that it's you know to respect the animal, but but what's the underlying philosophy over it? Respect the animal, respect life. It's sort of you know that you're allowed to eat the animal, but you're not. But the life is not something that's something that comes from God. You know, all life comes from God, not from us. And so taking life is something weighty, right? Um, the the blood of um, of the birds and of wild animals has to be buried even after you shaft it, right? It's like a sort of a um, Right. So this life force of the animal, we're not entitled to. We eat the animal, we're not entitled to its life force. Right. So there's some, there's some, I think that seems to be what it's about. And not becoming callous to eating meat. Um, we're becoming what? Callous to okay. suffering. Right. That we, that even you know we're allowed to eat meat and it's okay to eat meat, but that it's you know we're not um, oblivious to the fact that there's this you know, that it, you know comes at the expense of this animal's life. Um, I'd say the whole you know it, it, you know I'm a little um, in. Uh, you know, with industrial farming, the whole thing has become a little bit, you know, whatever, whatever the, you know, it's, it, the whole thing is a bit, uh, um, whatever the, 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 we're supposed to teach us, or supposed to mean, an industrial uh, farming situation, the whole thing is, I think, a little bit uh, um, cheapened, because you have, even if the shkita is painless, the animals are living miserable lives in mm -hmm. these confined, you know, like, in, you know, giant uh, feedlots, or, um, or wherever there are, you know, for, for the case of cattle or in, for birds in these, you know, um, indoor, you know, bird cities, you know, and uh, the shchita, even though, again, however meticulous the shchita is being, uh, it's something how it's different if it's like the, a bird that lives in your yard versus like an assembly line where the, the chickens are just coming down, you know, the assembly. Nonetheless, you know, to be kosher, you have to be healthy, you have to, you know, and, and the shchita is still, uh, you know, still a meticulous act of shchita, so, you know, be good as you can get. Um, kosher meat that is not from industrial uh, farming. There's a, there's a company on the East Coast called Cold Foods, and you can order meat from them frozen. They'll deliver it to you in a big styrofoam box with uh, dry ice. And it's, uh, these are animals that were pastured, that lived, you know, grazed outdoors, and uh, were sort of harvested in small batches. Um, certified kosher, black kosher, and they'll mail to you on the meat. It's, it tastes, it's incredibly expensive. As you would imagine, but maybe that's part of the point. You eat meat less frequently, like on Shabbat and holidays and special occasions, and uh, um, it tastes spectacular. Like it tastes, it tastes really different because how do you spell it? K O L Kol Foods, K O L Foods um, dot com. I guess the website has great pictures. Also, it's a very uh, uh, so that they sell you know poultry of various kinds and beef of various kinds. Okay. Tur also says there are non-kosher parts of kosher animals, particularly um, you know animals have to the sciatic nerve, uh, which is goes through the hind legs of four-legged animals, is not kosher, uh, and parts of the fats of um, these animals are not kosher. Uh, in modern, uh, so in, in well, pre-modern times, they used to remove the sciatic nerve and remove those forbidden fats from the animals. That was called traboring in Yiddish, or Nikor in Hebrew, to, to cut out the parts that are um, not kosher from the kosher animal. In a modern industrial operation, that's just not done. They just cut the animal in half, and the parts that are kosher get sold to the non-kosher you know, meat division of the same company, probably. And, and so that's why you can't get kosher sirloin steak in the United States, because that comes from the part that's like the back half of the animal, and it's just sold for, to non-kosher you know, meat supply. Um, it's possible to get kosher sirloin if you go through the very time, a painstaking, time intense process of removing the sciatic nerve. But there are very few people anymore who are even trained in doing that. So, in the United States, it's in other places, it is where you can find it. So, um, okay. So, 
This is um, I'm going to do D before C. The chart also says, in addition to these forbidden species and forbidden parts of kosher species, the requirement that kosher animals be shechted, shechita, be slaughtered in this ritual way, this kosher way, um, the Torah also says not to mix dairy and meat. So the Torah actually doesn't really say, literally, don't mix dairy and meat. The Torah says, lo tibesh al bidi mo, shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. The Torah says that three times. And the oral Torah teaches us that this means that there's a Biblical prohibition against cooking, eating, or deriving benefit from dairy and meat that have been cooked together. Once they've been cooked together, then there's a biblical prohibition against eating them together or, okay, and the cooking themselves is prohibited, can't sell it, right? So that's any type of dairy, any type of right? So that's even, you know, um, rabbinically that includes poultry as well. Okay, Torah we say it's just meat and dairy, but chicken and dairy is a rabbinic prohibition. Uh, that's the next, the, you know, from the earliest times of uh, the Benny period. So all of this is the, uh, you know, the Torah's rules of keeping kosher, and this is, you can all get this from reading the Torah itself, and then someone has to tell you what don't boil like it is what this book means, and then that, that's the Torah system of keeping kosher. The additional um, kind of uh, elements that are not clear in the Torah and are really more rabbinic than Torah, Torah law, rabbinic um, legislation, uh, is the uh, understanding that not only are we concerned about the non-kosher food itself, we're also concerned about the taste of the non-kosher food that might contaminate other foods. Uh, that the rabbis understood that taste can be absorbed uh, from one food to another, that taste can also be absorbed into pots and pans and utensils, and then expelled into other things that are then cooked with those same pots and pans and utensils. Now, this is actually true. <laughs> uh, meaning this actually happens. This is, like, this is a phenomenon that exists in the world, and you can see this yourself. If you use a wooden cutting board and chop onions, and then you chop an apple on that same wooden cutting board, that apple will taste like onion. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you use a, an iron skillet, uh, it, and it will absorb the taste of the things that are cooked in it, and that taste will be imparted into the subsequent things that you cook. Um, you're actually supposed to, like, that's why you're never supposed to wash a, uh, a wok with soap because it's supposed to absorb all the tastes of all the stir fries that you make in it, and that kind of enhances everything you cook subsequently in that wok. Um, so that's true for iron, it's true for wood, uh, which is what people used to cook with. Okay? With stainless steel and all the modern alloys, we don't really observe this phenomenon anymore. Um, but with pre modern, you know, until 70 years ago, stainless steel was invented in the 20th century, I believe. Until stainless steel was invented, this was something you, would, you could observe and feel yourself, uh, perceive yourself in your own kitchen. With our modern stainless steel appliances, it's not really something we experience anymore for the most part, but uh, we're still concerned uh, about, these, about these rules. So, um, tastes are absorbed. That means that um, some shrimp, you know, is cooked with your kosher food, you know, you, like the shrimp taste, you know, contaminates the kosher food. It means shrimp is cooked in your pot, so then the pot is, absorbs the taste of the shrimp, and then subsequent things you cook in that pot are contaminated with the taste of shrimp. Okay? And even if you can't perceive it, again, because it's a stainless steel pot, we still, we still apply the rule in the same way. Um, so that's um, absorption, that, that's, Roman, that's letter C, methods of absorption of taste. Now that is this, this concept that taste can be absorbed and expelled, and this, and this is something that we are concerned about. So how does this work? The, what's one of the physics or the chemistry of taste absorption? Taste is transferred through heat only. Uh, actually, I meant to save. Um, I think I did save. Hold on. Let me, okay. I saved the, um, one of the little Parsha, Torah portion little sheets that we have in the show was about this topic. So that's why I, when I knew we were going to speak about it, and I took them aside. But they might actually still be done, and I'll put them aside. But I'll, I'll show you later. But, um, so only if there's so, so if you have. Um, some, you take some, uh, let's see, you take some, I don't know why you do this, but let it, you take, uh, you take some bacon and you put it uh, on top of your hamburger to make like a little bacon burger or whatever it's called. And you're like, no, 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 we keep kosher, no, 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 take the bacon off. Okay? So, that's a bad example because it's kind of greasy. Let's think of a better example. Let's say, uh, let's say, a little accident in your refrigerator, 
and some milk falls on your chicken. So all you have to do, rinse it off. Rinse it off because it's cold. Okay, there's no absorption of taste. So you gotta make sure it's not still there. So you rinse it off. Um, the, ba the bacon on the hamburger is a bad example because it's greasy, so it's not so easy to rinse off, right? The grease is kind of makes it a little bit hard to rinse off. But if it were dry, there's no taste absorbed at all. Um, you put, uh, you have somebody put some, uh, um, it's, it's a cold, uh, those salads with ham chopped up in it, and put like a, um, what's it called, a, uh, Oh, I know what you're saying. Like chef's out, like, yeah, right? Chef's with the egg and the, right? Um, right? Blue cheese. Cow, yeah. Cobs, yeah, right? A little ham, cob salad, right? Okay, so what do you do in your plates? You just rinse them off, it's fine, right? Because it's cold. So nothing is absorbed, no taste is absorbed. On the other hand, if there's piping hot, um, you know, uh, whatever, you know, pork chop comes out of the frying pan and gets put on a plate, piping hot, then that taste is absorbed into the plate and you have to have a problem. You take your, your fork, you stick it into the, you use it to like stir the bacon in the frying pan, that fork is a problem now because it absorbed the bacon when it was piping hot. So the definition of piping hot is um, it's so hot that your uh, that, couple, that your hand recoils, right? It means you, if you were to go like this, boom, oh, I can't, yeah, you can't put your hand, you can't like touch it or, or carry it in your hand. Uh, the direction to, it, the, the Babylonian Talmud talks about yad, um, so let it bow, your hand recoils. The Jerusalem Talmud talks about ein hayad so let it bow, like you, your hand can't hold on to it. But it's actually the same, it's actually it's the same temperature. Um, another description of Talmud is the temperature at which a baby's belly is burned. Um, which uh, I had a teacher who once tried to like, ascertain the temperature. He called um, uh, like child family services and said, you know, how how hot uh, you know will uh, you know water will, will burn a baby's uh, belly? And they said, oh no, be, be very careful, sir. Like never. I understand it, but just tell them how hot would it be? Said, no, no, sir, you should ne never, never you know uh, risk a baby. I said, I understand that, but just, I, just let's say when I was curious, and, uh, and they said, you know, stay in the phone, sir. They hung up very long. Time. <laughs> So, piping hot, okay? If it's not that hot, you're not going to have a problem. So if you're washing dishes by hand, and you accidentally, a dairy fork gets mixed in with your, right? If you're washing them by hand, by definition, if you're washing by hand, it's not too hot to have your hands in it. Unless you're using gloves, or uh, it's really, really hot, and you're kind of washing it from the side, like that. But if your hands are in it, it's not going to be a problem, yes? But so if it's cold, you can, you can remove the tray from it? Still eat it. Yeah, unless it look if it's oily and, and greasy and leaves a residue, then it's a problem. But if not, let's say, again, if you have, you have your cob salad, so wash it out, we'd say, uh, But can you actually, if you just remove the ham from it, can you still eat the salad or not? So I, I think the problem there is the salad has a dressing, uh -huh. and, you know what I mean? Like that would, so if you think of an example of something which is like um, non kosher, but like dry and, you know, like. Like, like a sandwich. If you have like a, a sandwich with ham on it and cheese. Yeah, so again, I think the ham itself is kind of greasy, so it's maybe not a great example. So it's, it's sort of just all one together. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. if you could, there were a way, if you could think of a, a, something that would be, uh, that could be pulled out and would not leave, would be, if you could get all of it out, you would have to worry. Um, something dry, and that, you know, that they huh. pull out. Like turkey or something? Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Or like Parmesan that's like shaved, you could just pick it up and pull it out. It's yeah, dry. one shaving of not <laughs> which obviously resting on your salad, you could lift it off and it's, you can get all of it, there's nothing left behind. There's no sort of absorbed taste in there. Uh, you could, yeah, this is not quite as practical as, you know, here's the comparison. Um, you, you know, whenever there's a car accident, there, you know, the insurance companies um, write up an accident report. And the actual point is, right, this car came across the intersection and crashed this one here, and this is the result of the impact of these two cars at this speed, at this location, and this then happened afterwards, and such and so and so. So that's sort of like the laws of Kashu, right? Dairy falls into meat and this temperature and this location, and this is the halachic outcome of this encounter between kosher and non-kosher meat and dairy. Under these circumstances, this is then what the aftermath of those encounters. Uh, but learning how to drive is like not getting into those accidents, right? Yeah. You wouldn't learn how to drive from reading insurance company accident reports, right? Learning how to drive is all about uh, not getting into an accident. So how to keep a kosher kitchen and the laws of kashrut are really very separate because the laws of kashrut are if non-kosher food gets into your this under this circumstance or dairy meat, inter, inter, meat you know, mix under these circumstances, this temperature, in this way, for this amount of time, this is the result. 
Uh, but a kosher kitchen is like, let's keep everything separate. Let's make sure that those accidents, those encounters never actually occur. Yes? So, like, in one of the books I was reading, it was pretty much saying, like, if you're not sure, like, everything pretty much said, like, you should ask a rabbi. <laughs> like, every time something so, happens. That's does, like, does that happen a lot? Do people ask yes, you? Like, they often? do. They totally do. Yeah, and that's and it's totally normal and totally great. You can text me, like, oh, I actually used my spoon for blah, 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 blah. or I found this in my, oh, I, I thought I was using a kosher thing, but it turned out it was the non-kosher version of the blah, 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 blah. And I get those questions all the time, email, calls, and texts, and that's totally normal. Uh, it's also fine to learn the laws that you don't have, meaning yeah. sometimes the same things keep happening and then you don't have to ask each time. But it's fine to ask each time, that's totally fine, and, and that's literally my job to answer those questions. That's, Literally, what I went to school to learn how to do, as opposed to everything else that I do, which I thought I'd been doing half the time. But those those questions I actually studied, and usually know the answers. I can find them. Yes. So, so would the CRC t test us with these kind of things? Of course, of course, of course, of course. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Not just yeah. Any this is necessary information mm -hmm. to uh, convert to Judaism under any Orthodox system because you have to know how to keep kosher. Again, I, you know the, the the full you know if it's. Because you can ask a rabbi, you don't necessarily, you know, it, it's more important to know like a good system in place to keep your kosher kitchen. So you right. don't have non-kosher ingredients, and you have separate pots and pans for dairy and for meat, and you have a way to keep them separate, and, and then these actual technical questions shouldn't really come up, because you're careful not mm -hmm. to have those accidents, but when they do, you know, so it's important to realize that the heat thing is important, that's like a good, you know, thing to know mm -hmm. about. Um, um, is it the heat of the non-kosher thing? So if like a fly goes into your soup, but the fly is um, like fly temperature? Um, no, it, it, that's a good question. The fly in the soup is really in the soup. The question of whether you have something on top of the other, let's say you have a cold plate and a hot piece of, that is that is debated in the Talmud. Whether the thing, whether so if it, one of the things is hot, that's enough. That's debated in the Talmud. Like the fly is in the soup, that's not really a good case. A better case would be something hot on top of something cold. Okay. And that's called, uh, and that's the debate is the thing on top more significant, or the thing on the bottom more significant than the top, and, that, and so that, that, is a, that is a debate. Uh, if, if, um, uh, it, it, whatever, after, in the after effect, it's good to be careful about the, the, you know, if one, either one of them is, but it is actually, that is, that is a debate in the topic, so. Um, which really would only come up if you, I guess, putting something hot on a cold plate would be an issue, so we'd be, we'd be concerned. Uh, that's, how, that's how it would come up in a case like that. Could you use glass plates as a sort of workaround to avoid all this? So, that's just a narrow way to that. Um, yeah, let's wait. Let's wait for a second. Okay. Let's wait. Um, it's, it's a fine question. So, 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 so try to think of you. So he, also the other thing like he'll just say like if it's if we discuss this in Hill we learn about the laws of Shabbat that cooking can only take place in the heat of a primary vessel that's on the stove that 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 same rule applies to laws of Kasha as well taste is only transferred in the heat of a primary vessel so once it's no longer a primary vessel we say the heat isn't sufficient to cause transfer of taste so that's also a big leniency that means that if you take uh, your brisket out of the pot. Uh, and put it in a serving thing, and you bring it to the table, and then it goes on your plate. You're like, ah, I used a um, dairy knife to cut it. So, so what? That's fine. Because the, the point at which it was on your plate, it's no longer a primary, right? It's in a tertiary, right? It's in the pot to the serving thing, and then it's on your plate. That's fine. Uh, or the plate is a dairy plate. Oh my gosh, it's a dairy plate. That's fine. Because it was, um, I think we'll be in uh, the big show for Bilcha. Ah, okay. Okay. Like six minutes. Um, thank you. I assume if a bunch of you can stay for Mincha, so we'll move to the big show. Um, uh, so, so, so that's uh, what an example of that would be. Uh, um, yeah, you know, you, know, you, you use, well, it means that, that your dairy spoons, like, you know, I use my dairy spoon for this, or I, you know, I use my dairy knife to cut a thing. Up. So, is it really a dairy knife? In order to be a dairy knife, you would have had to use it to cut piping hot dairy. So if you take a, a, um, a quiche or a lasagna and you use your knife to cut it, then it would be a real dairy knife. But if you just use your dairy knife to cut, to eat with at the table, it's 
not actually a dairy knife because it hasn't been in contact mm -hmm. with piping hot food oh, from the... So all these things, in, when accidents occur, right? When people call me and they send me text, like, oh, I actually use like this. I say, well, let, let's tell me about this knife, okay? Is this really a dairy knife? You know, or is this the knife you use for dairy? Tell me about this plate. You know, what do you use it for? We're going to be in the big show for Nimcha. Um, camera will be in the big show for Nimcha. Starting in five minutes. Um, so right, so that's that's also why why this this is so sort of important to, to know. But again, in terms of like procedures, we use separate. We don't have non kosher ingredients in our in our kitchens, and we keep dairy and meat separate in our kitchens with separate utensils uh, for them. Uh, but it, but you don't have to worry. You, don't, you do not have to have separate drying racks for your dishes. You know, you can have dairy plates and meat plates touching each other on the drying rack because it's cold. It's fine. It's clean and cold, so that's that's okay. Uh, no taste is going to be transferred when they're clean uh, and cold. Um, you also need a liquid medium for taste to be transferred from one thing that they're absorbed in into another thing that's absorbed into. So for example, you have a, let's say you have a burner, a, you know, the, the, the grate on your stovetop. And let's say you're cooking a cheese sauce and some cheese sauce, whoop, you get a little too excited, and some cheese sauce splatters on the, the metal burner, piping hot. So that dairy taste is then absorbed into the, into the burner. We're going to be in the big show tonight. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so now you have some dairy taste absorbed in that burner. Then, but you clean it off, so it's, there's nothing, there's no residue on the outside. You just have your, right? But it's absorbed inside it. Then you have a meat pot that you put on that same burner. So there's a meat taste absorbed inside the pot. That doesn't matter. You can't have, or if your, your meat pot touches a dairy frying pan while they're both hot, because they're both on the stove maybe at the same time. So that's also okay, because you can't have an absorbed taste inside one thing, can go, leave it and go into the other thing without a liquid medium. If they're greasy on the outside, then that can be a medium for the taste to go back and forth between the two, between one pot and another pot, between one thing that's absorbed into and the other thing that's absorbed into. And it's called Ein Belua Yotzei Nechatecha El Chatecha Bli Rotep. Something absorbed inside a piece of food or inside a utensil can't leave it and go into another thing and be absorbed into that thing without some medium to cause a transfer of, of taste. What um, about sure. yes. sponges? Sponges. Things. Separate sponges for dairy meat, yes. And brush it, like... Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yes. Again, if you use the wrong one, accidentally, it's really fine because you throw water it was not so hot. Right? If, you, if you're washing dishes by hand, you're like, ah, oh, I used the wrong one. Okay, right? The water wasn't hot enough for taste to be... So as long as it's, you know, as long as it's not actual food in the sponge, it's just the taste that you're concerned may have gotten absorbed. Well, if it was co cool enough for you to do the dishes by hand, then, then you don't have to worry that taste was absorbed. So we use separate sponges, we use separate brushes, but when accidents happen, usually it's okay. So when people call me, or talk, like, usually it's fine. Yeah. So you shouldn't be scared. <laughs> Not always fine, but usually it is. Let's, let's pause now, um, and we'll continue with Kashu next class. Uh, if you're able to stay for them, I would very welcome and encourage you to do that. Uh, thank you.